I'm Mike Betcher, and because I can't resist being on, in front of a crowd and on camera, uh, I'm not supposed to be doing this. But I'm playing a video that will show us how precious water is, how it's in our everyday life, and how we don't think about it. And then Dr. Gabe will take over. of the water we have. The drought's worse. Norman is down to what they believe is near his core flows. live to reporters and editors across the nation who cover the drought and environmental issues. Further in recognition of our centennial, Gaylord journalism students are spreading across the region in a special pro uh, project to tell stories about the drought. These in-depth and enterprising stories will showcase some of our students' best work and they'll be published in the next six weeks or so on our student magazine website online called Roots, as in R-O-U-T-E-S. .ou.edu, and they also can be found on Twitter at hashtag watercrisis. We'd like to show you an example of one of our students' work. back in the early 40s, 1940, maybe 1939, well, they didn't raise any wheat. They might have raised, they might have cut two bushel wheat to get their seed, but uh, they never hauled anything to the elevator. Uh, they planted seven years without ever taking anything to the elevator. It was hard times, and uh, of course they had land payments. Uh, 1940, 41, in there they, they raised some good wheat crops. But 1944 was the best up to that time. Land, probably back in those days, was, uh, I'm going to guess, between uh, 25 and uh, $35 an acre. But in 1943, when it came, like in September, October, there was, it was dry, dry, dry. And my grandfather planted with a horse, or a team, team and a one-row planter, and, and raised some excellent cane. The first dust storm, real duster that I remember was like, April the 14th, 1935, when the dusters rolled in like that, 
it was it was you could see the ground in from east to west and just boiling rolling and all the birds were in front flying you know to to escape the death storm that was student that was student John excuse me then I won't credit the wrong person the nation hasn't been this dry for at least a half century and as you saw in this video from the 30s some of those memories of the Dust Bowl days are still alive and maybe being reincarnated if the drought continues it might have or will likely have further catastrophic consequences not only for Oklahoma but for much of the nation we're going to tackle these issues today about drought and its impact uh, from several key perspectives and our panelists include uh, leading scientists who study climate and weather an internationally respected analyst of the global water crisis a top insurance industry executive who will speak to the cost of extreme weather and then a top science and environmental reporter from the Associated Press I'd like to take a minute and introduce them please uh, first, uh, Derek Deke Arndt is coming to us via Skype from Asheville, North Carolina today. Uh, Deke is the chief of the Climate Monitoring Branch of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association's National Climatic Data Center. Whew. The Climate Monitoring Branch of the NCDC is responsible for tracking and assessing the state of the Earth's climate system. As an applied climatologist, his work encompasses research and service aspects that are focused on helping people make better climate and weather sensitive decisions. His most prominent work has been in drought monitoring. Next will be Dr. Harold Brooks. Dr. Brooks leads the modeling observation and analysis team at, the, at NOAA's National Severe Storms Lab in Norman, Oklahoma. Dr. Brooks research, er, focuses his research on the distribution of severe thunderstorm hazards around the world and on evaluating weather forecasts. He speaks at many conferences and scientific meetings and has given interviews to news media, including this morning on NPR's Diane Reams show. I also understand today's his birthday. He's been a busy man, so we're lucky to have him. Originally from St. Louis, Brooks received a PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Illinois. He joined, he joined N. SSL in 19, 1991 is a research meteorologist and he's received a Department of Commerce silver medal and three NOAA research awards. He also is elected a fellow to the American Meteorologist Society. To Mr. Brooks Wright is Don Ramsey or Dan Ramsey excuse me I'm sorry Dan. Uh, Mr. Ramsey has served as President and Chief Executive Officer of the Independent Insurance Agents of Oklahoma since 1998. He owned and managed an independent insurance agency in Chickasha for 22 years, from 1972 to 1994. In 94, he sold his agency and ran for the Oklahoma House of Representatives. He was the first Republican elected from Grady County in more than 60 years and the first to be ever re-elected. He was selected as one of 30 legislators in the United States to attend the prestigious Darden School for Emerging Political Leaders at the University of Virginia. And he left politics in 1998 and he joined the Insurance Agents Association. The journal record presented him in 1998 with the Insurance Service Award in recognition of his efforts on behalf of the property, property and casualty insurance industry. Our next uh, speaker will be coming to us from Sky, uh, from Washington D.C. via Skype, and that's Terry Dunmire. Uh, Terry co-authored the National Intelligence Estimate on Global Water in 2000. Intelligence. He is an investment banker and attorney specializing in international development activities, with a focus on building public and private partnerships on a global and sustainable basis. He served as director for business development for DINCOR International, where he created the United States Agency for International Development Community Stability Practice. His current business development work focuses on water and infrastructure sec sectors in Africa. And he is 
served as chairman for the policy recommendations for President uh, Barack Obama's administration. He's a member of the Atlantic Council, an advisor to several African-based training and logistic companies. He's also a graduate of Western New England College School of Law and the University of Virginia. And the last of our esteemed panelists today is Seth Bornstein, who's the national science writer for the Associated Press, the world's largest news organization. Seth covers issues ranging from climate change to astronomy. He is the winner of numerous journalism awards, including the National Journalism Award for Environmental Reporting from the Scripps Foundation. And he's a two-time winner of the Outstanding Beat Reporting Award from the Society of Environmental Journalists. He was part of a team of finalists for a 2004 Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster. Seth has been a science and environmental journalist for more than 20 years, covering everything from hurricanes to space shuttle launches. He's worked for Knight Ritter newspapers and their Washington Bureau, also for the Atlanta, Florida Sentinel, and for the Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Please join me in welcoming this group of panelists. All right, hello again from Nashville. Um, it's a piece through the, the nation's weather library, um, and we um, protect and, and serve all of the data that you see on the evening news um, and serve it back out to researchers, um, both in science and in industry, so that they can use it to analyze uh, climate data. And before I start, I, I, I'm also a University of Oklahoma alumnus, and I want to um, congratulate and thank the Gaylord College for doing, uh, shining a light on such an important issue. So it's, um, I, I still have a lot of family in Oklahoma that are affected by drought right now. So thanks for, um, for engaging this issue, guys. And, and with that, I'll, I'll start um, for slide number two, which is uh, the two guarantees that I can, can say about drought. Um, the first is that this drought will end. And the second is that there will be another drought. And um, I don't mean that in a flippant way. Drought is um, a natural part of our climate cycle. Um, so we see episodes of dryness and drought before we even talk about climate or climate change. Um, drought, especially in the plains, is a piece of the climate cycle that we see often. Um, and it is um, not going away. And it has been here a long time. Um, so when we're talking about drought today, um, we may use drought as shorthand for kind of increased episodes of drought or increased severity, um, but it has been with us for a long time. Um, and the next slide gets to that. So we should be looking at drought and climate now. And before we, again, address climate change, um, drought is not new, um, but it's also not simple. Um, drought is different than a lot of natural hazards in that it is um, directly associated with the way people use the resource. So we talk about tornadoes and we talk about hurricanes and a lot of times that is related to what they do to people. Um, drought has a component where, um, where we are part of it too. So it's, it's basically the simplest definition among a million really complex decisions or uh, definitions is the drought is simply when there's not enough water to meet needs and those can um, basically boil down to a supply and demand uh, relationship. So supply being precipitation or rain or snow, you know, the amount of water that falls from the sky is the simplest form of supply. And demand would be basically how much people need to use, how much ecosystems need to use, uh, how much crops need to use, industrial uses, um, you know, and then there's kind of this hybrid of constructs between them, like reservoirs, which is both, you know, it is a temporary supply based on expected demand. And so it's this giant kind of economic management issue when you think about um, water as the currency. Um, and there are a lot of factors that I won't even get into, and maybe, maybe other folks on the panel will, that have to do with, you know, I'm just going to be talking about the climate system, the physical climate itself, but there's agricultural need, there's population growth, there's industrial need of water, um, and, and those all kind of feed into drought and water resources as we go on. So if we hit the next slide, it, um, it's about drought and our changing climate. So, um, you know, the, the physics of climate change basically says 
that a warmer atmosphere can do a few things with, with water. A warmer atmosphere can, can hold and convey more water vapor. Uh, a warmer atmosphere can evaporate more water um, from the soil or from a, a surface of water. And a warmer atmosphere, because it can hold or convey a lot more water vapor, can potentially deliver a lot more water in large doses as well. And so we see all of these things together and what we would expect in a warming world and what we're indeed seeing in the data is that the, the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle, that cycle where water goes from evaporation into cloud formation into precipitation and runoff, that in many parts of the world and on average, the cycle is more vigorous. And we see that not just in rainfall statistics, but we even see that in the oceans. The parts of the oceans that are dominated by evaporation and are naturally a little saltier than the rest of the ocean, they're getting saltier. The parts of the ocean where a lot of precipitation occurs and the waters are a little fresher or less salty, they're getting even fresher. So we see this um, hydrologic cycle intensification going on throughout the world, but especially in our data here in the U.S., we're seeing um, in general, as a rule of thumb, this is kind of your two out of three, three out of four kind of rule with lots of local exceptions. Um, the richer getting richer, the wetter getting wetter, basically. The wetter getting wetter, the drier getting drier. That means wet places and dry places are in general, on average, getting wetter and drier, respectively. Wet seasons and dry seasons, in general, with lots of local ex exceptions, are getting wetter and drier. Um, and this is basically foreseen by much of modern climate scientists, and it's also borne out um, by the data. So um, big rain is becoming bigger. And ironically, you know, in many places, big drought is uh, becoming bigger as well, where we have the, the good data to support that. The next slide um, is drought and changing climate, the second slide. And going back to that concept of supply and demand, you know, it's not just an invigorated water cycle. So the whole point of the last slide was in a warming world, we would expect to see more concentrated episodes of rain with maybe larger or longer dry periods in between. But going back to that supply and demand concept, a warmer atmosphere also represents a greater tax on, on water soil moisture. Um, and water in the ground and on the ground. A warmer atmosphere um, basically can ask for more water. It's a, it's a tax. So in that supply and demand scenario, the demands become where we have the increasing human need for water, and then we also have an increasing atmospheric demand for water. So that's how climate change can play into um, drought scenarios. One, a concentration of rainfall events from many events, this is generalizing, many events into fewer events that are bigger with longer dry periods in between. And also this persistent, if the, if the atmosphere is warmer, it's going to be taking more water from the soils and from the plants and from the surface water that we see on the ground. Uh, 2012 was really emblematic of this. Um, so the graph on the right shows um, the, uh, the smooth line is kind of the average greenness that we would see in the Midwest. I believe this is actually for Illinois. Um, the average greenness that we'd, we would see from satellite, basically using a satellite eyeball that can see the color green. And you can see that the year 2012, early in that season on the left shoulder of that graph, shoots up very early where there was much more green in the region than there, there was on on an average year, and that was the really, really warm March. And so we saw all of this uh, uh, greenness emerge, all the plants greened up, the crops, the, the horticulture, the grasses, the trees. Basically, we saw a big greening episode, and that asks for more water from the ground. Active plants are thirstier than dormant plants. Um, and then you can see as we got into the drought, into the spring and summer, um, we saw a browning down of that region as well. And um, this is the type of signal that we would expect to see more often in a warming world. Now, the, the drought of 2012, what drove it, I, um, that's still, you know, a lot of analysis to go. But we do know that this is the type of thing we would expect to see more often. And we do know 
uh, based on calculations that the heat associated with spring of 2012 really accelerated um, the degradation down into uh, drought in the summer. Um, the next slide shows uh, another effect. We don't often think of the lakes being in drought, but the Lake Michigan and Huron, which is basically the same lake hydrologically, even though we have two names for them, um, even though we've seen a lot more precipitation in the basin in recent years, we've also seen higher winter temperatures over the, the last few years. And uh, those acting together, again, increase the evaporation from the lake. The ice that's retreating from the lake exposes that water where more of it can be ev evaporated. And we've seen uh, like a multi-year drought in the Western Great Lakes um, as well, um, just as an, as an example. And then finally, I have uh, two final slides, you know, uh, the next slide should have a photo of what we've all seen in the, um, you know, from the Dust Bowl, this classic uh, USDA pictures. And, and drought, you know, in today's drought, it really isn't like this anymore, you know, this complete desolation. What drought is, is an issue of supply and demand where water becomes more costly. It becomes more costly to extract, it becomes more costly to use and it becomes more costly to find. Um, so um, the next slide, again, if you're thinking about covering drought, it's definitely not um, sexy. There, um, it's not visually compelling often. It's definitely not as visually compelling as that previous uh, picture because the impacts are not always visible. And, and if I could just, um, you know, state, you know, there's not a lot of screaming, there's not a lot of drama, there's not a lot of instant gratification with covering or dealing or working with or managing drought. It's a long-term process. Um, and just so to kind of um, contrast with violent weather, um, which is very popular, I know, um, uh, in the media nowadays, you know, you prepare for violent weather by preparing your structures. You prepare for drought by preparing your plants. Um, in violent weather, you know, the violent weather tests the resilience of your structure where drought tests the resilience of your community. Um, the impacts of drought are felt on a communal level. Uh, and, and it's not seen, you know, you see debris um, very easily in the wake of violent weather. You see branches and, and, and belongings and pieces of buildings strewn everywhere. In drought, the debris looks like lawsuits. The debris looks like foreclosures. The debris looks like bankruptcies. You know, that's what the debris of drought looks like. So if you're, if you're standing drought up to more exciting violent weather, those are the types of items, residue, artifacts that you'll find in the debris trail of drought. And it's typically stressing our community systems. Can we get water to the community? Can we manage the water without suing each other to death? Um, those are the issues that are tested um, by a drought. And then finally, there's typically an after school special kind of ending to a lot of coverage of, of violent weather. And it's, you know, the town vows to rebuild. Um, and in drought, it's a much longer term after school special ending. And I'll go back to my roots as an Oklahoman. The 1950s were extremely dry in Oklahoma, um, in some places rivaling the drought of the 30s. But they didn't write novels about the 50s, and that's the after-school message. So instead of we'll rebuild, it's we'll teach this, this generation and the following generation how to manage water-sensitive resources better. Uh, the sons and daughters of the people that made it through the 30s managed the 50s actually relatively very, very well. And those are the types of um, we'll rebuild uh, messages that I think that come out of drought. And with that, I think my time is up, and I'll uh, I'll hand it back. I'm talking a little bit about sort of the seasonal aspect and some of the forecasts that we that we currently have available, uh, and show you some sources of where you can get information. If you want to go ahead and go on up, uh, they're available from the Climatic Prediction Center, the Climate Prediction Center from INSEP, uh, and they provide a, a series of, of products that forecast uh, probability of above and below normal for temperature and precipitation, and for uh, a pre precipitation anomaly, and so the uh, and they'll they work in three categories. We're either above normal, near normal, below normal. It's a you know 
the gradations aren't real large here. Uh, and I'll go ahead and go look at the, at the, at the most recent forecasts. So, this is for March, April, and May of this year. Uh, and these forecasts go out for, uh, you can get them out for about 15 months, three month, every three month period that they go through. Uh, this is, on the left side is temperature, and on the right side is precipitation amount. We'll talk about the temperature forecast first. Uh, the, the browns and oranges colors are above, nor or the probability of above normal. The blues represent below normal temperature. So most of the US in this case is considered to be uh, above normal temperature. This is for March, April, and May. And we're kind of in the highest probability region of being above, above normal. You'll see that little region up in, up in uh, centered around Washington that's below normal temperature. Uh, this is the only one of the, of the next 15 month plots in which there is any below normal temperature probabilities provided. Okay. The, the, and, the, and this is based off of, the, of the, off of the temperature normals from 1981 to 2010, which in general are warmer than the temperature normals prior to that. So the, climatic, the Climate Prediction Center is forecasting essentially for at least through next summer, so summer of 2014, that the U.S. will be above normal temperatures. That's maybe not the real good news. Uh, but then we'll get to the less good news, which is the precip uh, forecast. And, uh, oops, go, can you back that up? Yeah, there we go. This is now a, a, a precip, uh, precip anomaly. So how far above and below the, the, the darker colors are more below normal or more, more above normal. The greens are wetter than normal. And we have a small area of the US around Indiana and Illinois in which they're forecasting above normal for the next three months, March, April, May. Uh, dry in, we're kind of on the edge. We may be near normal uh, precip here, but that out in the Texas panhandle below normal. And if we go forward a couple of months into the springtime, which is the next slide, what we see now is there's a bullseye of below normal precip uh, centered right, well, it's actually just south of here, so, you know, Oklahoma City, we're probably good. But this is uh, averaging more than an inch below normal is the, is the average uh, uh, forecast out of the, from the Climate Prediction Center. And when they do their, when they try to put some uncertainty in that, uh, it, it, there's a chance, there's a, uh, you know, about a 20% chance that will actually be normal in Oklahoma for precip, uh, much more likely chance that will be below normal, and in fact, we, uh, there's an e the, the same probability of being normal we have of being about three or four inches below normal for the, for the summer months. So if you liked last year and the year before, uh, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna be real happy this year. Uh, and that's the, and they, the precip anomalies that they show on these maps don't go out as far in time because there, there's less confidence in precipitation forecasting than there's in temperature forecasting. So, it's likely, given that they're forecasting above normal temperatures for the entire year, that it will be below normal precipitation, assuming that that, forecast, assuming that, that temperature forecast holds. Now, as, as, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Gade mentioned, I'm a, I'm a severe weather guy. And so one of the questions we get asked a lot is, what happens when we have patterns like this? What happens to severe thunderstorms and tornadoes? And we've been doing some work recently on, on that topic and trying to actually see what we might be able to say. Because one of the questions that I get asked a lot this time of year is, what's tornado season going to be like this year? Okay. And I'll give you the clear and concise answer. We don't know. Okay. Uh, and that's about as good as we can get. However, we're starting to learn some things. Uh, and the next slide indicates uh, uh, we, we, we really don't have any skill in forecasting this season. And one of the things that we also get asked, do you remember last year in the, in the US, we got off to a very fast start for tornadoes. The first January, February were near records. And we would guess, does this mean the season's going to be really, really bad? Because everyone was remembering the, the tornado season of 2011. And the answer was, there's no correlation between the early part of a tornado season and the later part of a tornado season. What's happened the first two months tells us nothing about what will happen the rest of the year. We've had big years, big end of years after, after big beginnings. We've had really small years, like last year after the beginning of the year. The first three months of last year were in the top 10% of all January, Februarys, and Marches. And then we had six consecutive months that were in the bottom 10% of the, of the year. So we really have no way of telling what's, what's going on. So what we can actually say is we can start to look at, at some things we see when we look at the historical record. And if we look at the temperature profile, this is now a, a chart that shows you what the impact of raising the US national temperature is on tornado numbers. And if we look at this in the winter time, when winter is warm, we have more tornadoes than normal. 
When summer is warm, we have a lot fewer tornadoes than normal. So when we get into a drought situation like we had last year, our expectation would be we would have very few tornadoes. It was hot, very dry. And in fact, June, the, period May, the period from May through August was the lowest May through August for tornadoes in the almost 60 years of good records that we have. So one upside to having drought is we don't get very many tornadoes, if you choose to look that way at, at things. Uh, and that, that makes some basic sense in that when if, you know, to get, a, to get tornadoes, you have to have thunderstorms, which means you're probably getting rain. And if you have a lot of rain, you don't, you don't get very much in the way of drought. But we also know that the pattern of the atmosphere that sets up to produce rain on the large scale pattern is the same pattern that, that, produces, that produces tornadoes. And so when we have a large ridge over the central part of the United States, we get drought, we get high temperatures, we also don't have the right kind of conditions to make tornadoes. So they go, they go together, and if we could ever get better at forecasting sort of the large scale conditions for drought, we might be able to do a better job of forecasting seasonal, seasonality of, of tornadoes. But this is roughly, uh, for every degree the U.S. warms in the wintertime, on average, we get about seven more tornadoes uh, a month, which is roughly 10, you know, five to 10% you know, more tornadoes than what we would get. And we lose about 40 tornadoes for every degree we warm up in the middle of summer which is about 20% of the tornadoes we'd expect to see in summer. So hot temperatures are really big for, for very few tornadoes. We also see some changes in where tornadoes occur. This, this diagram is, compares the average location of the 10, from tornadoes of the 10 warmest years and the 10 coldest years in the last 60 years. Uh, the, the cold is in the, is in the green, or is in the blue, and the average position is located, by, is located we have January, March, May, that heads from Alabama into Arkansas, up into Illinois in, in July, back down south to Mississippi by the time we get to November. The warm years, January, the average January tornado happens in northern Mississippi, and then moves northward and, and westward. So in winter time, in warm winters, we have tornadoes that occur further northwest than what we would see in, in earlier in the year, and that starts to impact Oklahoma a lot earlier than it would otherwise, because this is an average position. Cold winters, we don't get tornadoes in Oklahoma. Warm winters, we actually get them in, in, in February and March uh, with some frequency. And as we go further into the season, the tornadoes start to occur further north, so that a warm, a warm, uh, a warm year, we might not get very much in Oklahoma in May, uh, whereas we had gotten some earlier in the year. And, in, and as we move into the summertime, the tornadoes start to move east of where they would be in, in the warm season compared to the cold season. So that again, the plains essentially shut off from tornadoes, which is what we saw, we've seen in the last two years, very few tornadoes in the plains of the United States occurring in the summertime. So we're starting to get a handle on how we understand how hot years versus cold years behave. Our real challenge right now is translating that into a forecast product, that we really aren't very good right now at being able to, at being able to forecast these things. But this is, this is sufficiently at the edge of research that if I would have done this talk last Friday, or a week last Monday, I couldn't have actually shown you this. That's just where we've gotten started on doing this kind of work. So we're at the very beginning stages of it, and if we have this meeting again next year, we may be able to say something with a little more confidence than we currently can. So I think that's it. Oh, sorry, I did, there is one more thing in here. Uh, two more things, actually, sorry. Slide. This is now when we've set monthly records for tornadoes. The red dots represent maximum records for months. The blacks are, are minimum records. You'll notice that all the records occur in the recent part of the years. In the last 10 years, we've set four records for the most tornadoes in a month, and we've set six records for monthly records for the fewest tornadoes in a month. That's 10 records out of the 24 possible records have all occurred at both extremes in the, in the United States. We've also seen a change, uh, not in the average timing of the, go forward more, uh, not in the change of the average timing of when season begins. This is when the 50th tornado of the year. That's kind of a, a metric for the beginning of the season. The average timing of the season hasn't changed at all. But in the last 15 years, we've had the three earliest starts to the season in, in 1998, 2008, and 2011, or 2012. We've also had four of the five latest starts to the year in the last 15 years. Our average date of the tornado season beginning hasn't changed, but it's become much more variable. And this is one of our challenges to try to interpret as we go forward into the future is an appearance that we've had a, a, a dramatic increase in the variability of tornado occurrence, which may lead to some real challenges for how we deal with tornado occurrence, as well as dealing with the precipitation anomalies that are associated with those kinds of changes and variants that we would have seen in the, we've seen in the past. 
that is it. So. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have been invited to be a part of this august panel. I, I feel a little overwhelmed by the scientists in the room, and I, I fear I've got some charts on the on the board that are scientific charts. So I, I'm not going to talk much about them. I'll show them to you, and they can explain them. But uh, uh, when I was asked to speak, I was asked to speak about weather, and I was thinking uh, tornado. Naturally, around here, you think wind, uh, tornadoes, hailstorms. But then I said, they said no drought, and so uh, that came up with a whole entirely new thing because uh, in my normal activities, that uh, drought isn't really something we get that much involved with uh, on a direct basis because uh, you know you don't usually get a, a claim to a home because of drought. Uh, you usually get it from wind, hail, or, or, or tornado. But uh, I couldn't have had uh, helped be touched by the Ken Burns documentary recently on PBS on the Dust Bowl. And it was a, a stark uh, story about Oklahoma and, the, and their, actually the durability, durable nature of, of Oklahomans and, and what, what they went through in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas panhandle. And uh, uh, I, I, was, uh, I, I was also stricken by the uh, conversation I had with one of our member agencies out in Guyman recently. And he told me actually that the drought conditions in Guyman today were worse than they were in the Dust Bowl in, in the 1930s. But uh, the fact of the matter is that the, uh, due to the activities taken uh, in the area of water resources and soil conservation and water conservation since the 1930s, in 1930 when the Crop Insurance Act was formed, or Crop Insurance Agency was formed, uh, to do some experiments and to uh, see, see what they could do to address uh, the issue so that this didn't recur again. Uh, those those practices have worked, so that we don't see the the tumbleweeds uh, like we saw in the in the uh, documentary there. We don't have uh, a lot of the pictures that we see, and I think we did learn a lot. And I think the 50s. I grew up in the 50s, and I, I don't think it was quite as rough as maybe it was as dry as the, and hot as it was in the 1930s. But certainly we didn't have to pay the price like they did there, and and uh, that has to do a lot with the lessons learned from the from the 1930s. But the Crop Insurance Corporation was formed in 1938, and, and it's evolved over the years to, uh, and it was specific, it was originally formed to, to only address crop needs, uh, crop protection for certain crops, certain types of crops in certain states. And so over time, that's evolved. I think we go back a little. I'm not, I'm not there yet. He's ahead of me. I'm not there yet. Well, I'll get there in a minute. But the, but the uh, crop insurance uh, uh, has expanded to different, uh, different uh, areas in, uh, of country since then. The 1980s was a big expansion where it took in more states, it took in more crops that are, that are protected by, the, by crop insurance. And, uh, and so today, uh, it, uh, it is, it's very broad in the, in the, in the, in the things that it covers and the, in the areas that it covers. So I do have some, uh, some I'll go back to the first one if you would please, Mike. Uh, the, the first one is a drought uh, monitor, U.S. drought monitor, and this is where I'm going to get dangerous. I may have to ask one of my experts over there, but but and I say NOAA is one of the contributors to make this uh, this uh, drought uh, this uh, drought monitor available. I just discovered this, and I must credit a fellow named Max Claybaker for Claybaker Crop Insurance and in, in Blackwell and and uh, Madeline Flanagan from the Independent Insurance Agency Brokers of America and uh, Tom Zacharias from the National Crop Insurance Services for their help in putting together some of this information today. So they've uh, led me to the right place, and hopefully we'll be able to impart some uh, some of their information to you to have a, have a little bit look for the insurance side of, of where we are with the drought. But anyway, this shows a drought monitor as we are today. And you can look at the state of Oklahoma right here in the middle. And as I mentioned before, if it's red and brown and those colors right there, uh, that isn't very good. That means that, oh, look over here, the drought ind index, we're going uh, to, uh, two, three, or four, I think, and everything, which is not good. It's either stream or severe uh, drought conditions for the entire state of Oklahoma, March 5th. So, uh, 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 and the next slide shows a short-term drought indicator, which uh, looks a little better. But this is only a uh, temporal because it only it, it takes into account some of the rain, so the snow we had a week ago. So it looks out six weeks, uh, six months, to see what kind of drought conditions we can expect around the country. And then in Oklahoma, you see it greens up a little bit, and still on the eastern side, it's kind of kind of a white still. But in the in the really on the western side, for the short term, it has gotten a little moisture that was was uh, sorely needed. But in the next one, you will see in the long term, next slide, you'll see we're back into the, to the high drought stages again for the long term. And this, this is an indicator that the uh, surface water levels are, are, are very low, that the reservoirs are low. If you've seen the, uh, the uh, scene now Canton Lake and just drive out to uh, uh, Lake Hefner and see that there hadn't been any water out there for a while and so that we have a, a severe drought. So uh, that under, under, under uh, 
underlying uh, lake conditions today, the reservoir conditions today, indicate that the long-term picture is, is kind of bleak uh, for us to have uh, any relief. And, and as, uh, as most of you are aware, water is, uh, is a big uh, Supreme Court battle right now. Uh, who's going to get the water? Who's going to get Oklahoma's water? We're fighting Texas to keep our own water right now. And, uh, and so that's going to go to the Supreme Court. So, you know, some say that water is the new oil. It's going to be the next oil. So who's going to get that water is going to be critical. And so I think we must uh, certainly uh, have to do what we can to conserve the water that we have. But, but it's uh, important to be aware of what's going on with, with water and how it impacts us today. So let's look at some, some losses. Go back to the numbers that Mike was talking about earlier. So let's look at some of the claims. This was very interesting to me. This is from the RMA, which is the crop insurance folks. Uh, the multiple crop insurance program. I, I have, uh, from, I, I've went back, I, I asked them to go back for, to 2008 so we could look at some numbers of losses for crop insurance. Uh, and in 2008, there was $85 million in losses in crop insurance. And that's in Oklahoma. That's in Oklahoma. I, I, I believe that's, uh, yes, in Oklahoma. Uh, $85 million in crop. In 2009, $315 million crop insurance losses. 2010, $43 million. 2011, $423 million. And, and 2012, 197 million. So you can see it's kind of an up and down thing, but the numbers are pretty, pretty significant, especially in 2009 and 2011. You look at the, I just got some abbreviations, type of, type of loss. Uh, drought was number one in 2008, being 42 million, almost 50% of the claims paid were from drought in 2008. In 2010, 14 million out of 43 million. 2011, 291 million out of 423 million. And in 2012, a 92 million out of 197. The only exceptions in those five years was extreme moisture in, in 2009, where uh, extreme moisture was number one in those uh, 315 million, it was $175 million in claims. So uh, the, the number two ranking uh, in those years, we see extreme moisture, 14 million, uh, and this is uh, from uh, uh, freeze in uh, 2002, uh, I mean 2009, that I means 85 million. Drought, again, was number second, uh, was, I think that's the chart's wrong there. Uh, this number slid over somehow. Uh, but anyway, hot winds was $58 million paid in the same year that the drought was paid in 2011, so that was a very, very difficult year. And uh, this was, uh, uh, this was a, actually a, uh, uh, the leakage of, a, of, a, of a, uh, irrigation systems was $42 million caused in, in, uh, 19, in 2012 was from irrigation systems uh, uh, faulting. And then the number three in uh, 2008 was from, uh, was, uh, from hail, number, in 2009 from, uh, from uh, uh, depressed prices, $16 million in depressed prices. Uh, number three in this, uh, in 2010, was from, from uh, winds and uh, from heat. In two, it looks like 2011 was amazing. If you look at that 423 million claims, drought was 291 million. He, he, uh, hot winds, 58 million, and heat, 42 million dollars. So the big, by, by large margins, was heat and dry weather was a cause of our claims in 2011. And then, in, again, in heat was number three in 2012, where we had 21 million dollars. So, so uh, those extreme weathers do cause insurance companies to pay a lot of money out in claims to farmers uh, to purchase those types of products. And there's there's expanded products. But it, it, originally, it was just to cover the, the loss of yield or loss of bushels. But today, you can buy a total weather insurance where you could buy actually uh, projected uh, earnings or you can buy uh, from insurance with new products that have been developed. Thanks, Mike. So crop hail insurance, here's, a, here's kind of a history on crop hail. It's specifically hail losses in Oklahoma. Uh, in 2008, there was $173 million in liability with premiums 14 million and losses of 17 million. So got paid 70 million, took in 14 million. It's hard to make money that way. 2009, 85 million liabilities, uh, 7.5 million in premiums, but there they only paid 3.3 million in losses in 2010. And remember, this is just hail only. Uh, 2010, 108 million in liability, 9.9 in premium, 4.8 in, in losses paid, 11. Uh, 104 million in liability, 6.7 million premiums, 4 million in losses, and go on. 8, 185 million in liabilities in 2012, 12 million premiums, and 9 million in losses. So that's kind of a real quick look at what the crop hail losses were about. The next the slide shows tornadoes in in uh, 2011 and 12. And I think my charts are kind of when I, you know, sometimes when you bring uh, you do things at your office on a on a flash drive and you bring them to a different computer. 
they kind of jump off the different columns, and I think that's what's happening here, but that's okay. No, that's okay. No, no, it's not, not your problem, Mike. Uh, but here in 2000, we can, we can do this anyway. Uh, in 2010, uh, there were tornadoes. There were 1,282 uh, tornadoes around the country in 2010. In 2011, there were 1,691 tornadoes. In 2012, there were 1,119. And in those claims paid, in, in 2010, there was $9.5 billion in claims paid from tornadoes in, in, in 2010. It was $25 billion paid in 2011. I think that was mentioned that was a big, big year in tornadoes, and obviously this indicates that. We had more, more, more storms and higher, more storms, 1,600 storms, almost 1,700 storms, $25 billion in claims paid. And then in 2012, almost $15 billion in claims paid. In 2011, there were two and a half, more than two and a half times the previous record in claims and dollars paid in losses. I mean, I mean, dollars paid in losses. There were 758 tornadoes in April of 2011, which is the highest on record. Next slide, please. So tornadoes and related deaths in, in Texas. There were 117 storms, uh, tex uh, thunderstorms or tornadoes in, in 2012. Uh, in Kansas, there were 95. In Oklahoma, there were 63. No deaths in Texas, one in Kansas, and six in Oklahoma. And Kentucky had the highest number of deaths, 23 people killed in tornadoes in, in 2012 in Kentucky and in Indiana, uh, 14. And those were the highest death states from the, from, due from tornadoes. Uh, so the, next, the last slide I have here is about uh, 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 winter storms. And in winter storms, there was 385, 385, uh, $384 billion paid in, in, storm, in winter storms in 2012. Uh, tropical storms, you don't think about this as being winter storms here, but hurricane and tropical storms, 42% uh, of those, 160. Uh, one billion dollars paid tornadoes 130 billion dollars paid and then you want to look on in winter there's a winter storm charts and only 28 percent were in winter storms i mean i'm 7.4 percent of winter storms so you can see on around where uh but these are all except for uh terrorism and fires and others you have weather related claims that are being paid in this in this chart 384 billion dollars so uh, um, uh, over 300 billion dollars paid in weather related losses in, a, in the year 2012. So it's a significant number and a significant concern for the insurance industry. Thank you very much. Um, some years ago, there was a scientist uh, by the name of Bob Bissem, and he had been actually convinced that somewhere along the line, the water measurements that we're using um, needed to be improved. And so he set to work putting together and testing some of his theories, both in the Sudan and in Somaliland, and then uh, New England, and then in the Caribbean. And over the course of years, has come up with a number of different models, um, which are now economically proven, that underneath the existing structures of the, the Earth's crust, or in the existing structures of the Earth's crust, are, are capillaries and veins and arteries of water which augment the existing water supply. Uh, they originate basically from the rainfall on mountains uh, which then permeate the, the rock and then work their way through. They, they explain a number of geological anomalies, um, both pockets of fresh water located uh, in offshore, for example, or situations in South Sudan, which is where it all started, where in the middle of de the desert were just like large amounts of water which were able to be used on a sustainable basis for agricultural purposes. And so that kind of a, a theory was then put to test economically because it, it, it's great to have theories, but they have to be proven and they also have to be viable. And so that economic theory was then invested in and has been put to test both in the Caribbean, in Texas, uh, where it, it's supporting the fracking industry because it's using water that is not potable. And consequently, that reserves the aquifers for drinking water while using the uh, mega watershed water for industrial purposes. Same thing in North Dakota. Um, and then to use the same model and drilling deeper 
in several cities in Mexico now, um, and as well as Panama, which which geologically is one of the best places for this. Um, again, it's it's coming online, and uh, in fact, contracts were just signed the other day in, in uh, Panama. So, from the standpoint of can we sustain everything as it exists? The answer I would say is no, but sort of through the world of science, through the world of research and development, through the collaboration of the corporate world, the scientific world, and within the governmental se sectors, I think there is a, a real opportunity for lots of different technologies to come online and be put to use. Um, the Israelis have just come up with a remarkably energy efficient and cost efficient desalination process. Uh, I don't know if anybody's following any of that, but again, that that's being used in the in the Middle Eastern region, uh, particularly in Oman. Um, the the technology behind desalination hasn't been worked on for about thirty five years. And the leading venture capitalist in Israel took a look at the needs of the region and the demographics and, and put some money behind it, recruited a number of scientists and, and basically said, you know, see if we can't solve this problem. And after many times the investment, um, as well as, you know, revolutions within the scientific community and what have you, um, they actually did succeed in coming up with a, a scientifically viable and economically viable desal capability. Um, and so, I, again, I would, I would argue that what we look at um, from any number of angles is what is being done currently um, across the industrial sector, the human consumption sector, the agricultural sector, and as well as the geopolitical sector, because that in and of itself is its own kind of, of category. Um, the Indus being one area, the Nile Basin in Africa being another. Um, we have our own issues, which are minor, being the Mississippi and the Great Lakes. Um, but I think that, that as we go forward, we'll see flashpoints in terms of control of the water. Turkey controlling the headlands of the Tigris and Euphrates, for example, uh, that runs down. Then whoever's controlling sort of the upstream has an edge. So how do you how do you work through that? Um, the overlay then within the Islamic uh, governed countries uh, where water actually belongs to everyone. It's not a private property right. And so it, it, it belongs to it's the common property doctrine, uh, which we have here in common law that is has been sort of diluted. So I think that there again you've got issues to negotiate out, and it's going to require, I think, the brain power and the support and the collaboration of the scientific community and the business community, the financial community, and the political community in order to solve some of these problems. Um, because otherwise, you can't use the existing available water as it's located unless you want to pipe things from you know Manitoba to Chicago it's, it's not feasible and uh, so that's that's what I would see in terms of answering that question okay thank you sir we'll stay on the line and uh, we have another speaker and we'll have some questions trying to make sense of all these issues are journalists <laughs> Seth Bornstein covers this beat and has for a long time. Uh, based on uh, what we've heard today, maybe Seth could talk to us a little bit about how these stories may indeed come together and be written and be made sense of. <laughs> it's not you. Yeah, no, I noticed that. Uh, that's okay. I, the first thing I want to tell you is something that's not in there because it literally is breaking news from my email box. Um, from the United Nations this morning, the... Uh, Center for the Research and Epidemiology of Disasters, uh, CRED, just uh, put out some figures for 2012, nothing like doing it quickly. And uh, they said that 2012 had over $100 billion in, uh, disaster, uh, in damage from natural disasters. That's the third straight year in a row of $100 billion or more from natural disasters. 
Uh, we, the world hadn't hit the 100 billion mark until about 20 years ago. Now we've had three in a row. I don't know if they've adjusted for inflation. I haven't talked to, gotten a chance to talk to them yet. But $100 billion, just to think of it here, given the 7 billion people in the world, if you all just gave me $15, that's the $100 billion, we'd be, we'd be all very happy. So now let's just try to go through quickly to, to, to synthesize what you've all heard and also to bring it for uh, how reporters can, should, and sometimes aren't, often aren't, covering this, I this issue. So first, uh, since I, t you know, I like to talk about big numbers and interesting numbers, let's, uh, so Deke will tell you this, um, but the last month, the, uh, and the NCDC, Deke's group, found a colder than average um, month was in February 1985. Now, I may be going on a limb because on Thursday he'll announce what February 2013 has been, but I'm willing to bet it's going to be warmer than normal. And Deke, feel more than free to tell me if it isn't. So just to put things in perspective, that's when Mel Gibson was the sexiest man alive. <laughs> and nearly half the people on Earth were not born. Half, nearly half the people on Earth have never lived through a colder than average month. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know about you, just thinking about that really gets it to me. All right, but one other way, because I like big numbers, let's go. That's 336 months in a row. Obviously, see, I hadn't updated the second graph enough. If you flip the coin 336 <laughs> times, that's one in one um, uh, in thirty. Yeah, actually, it's one. Uh, three, eight, and I'm not going to read all those zeros. <laughs> but if you looked at that, that is one followed by 101 zeros. Does anyone here know what one followed by 100 zeros is called? Google. It's a Google. That was the original Google. That is what Google was named after. It is the chance of this happening naturally is bigger than Google. So just another way to put, to think of it. You've seen this. We'll just skip through this. But when you look at that, Next time you go to the drought monitor, if you're, if, if you're a reporter or if you're a scientist, don't just look at the pretty pictures. You'll see there's some tabulars that'll give you some t statistics. Uh, just to, give you, to explain this, this is for the lower 48 states. D, uh, none means they're not dry. Um, D0 is, is abnormally dry but not really drought. D1 is a drought, then you know, moderate, severe, and then it's, oh my god, that's D4. <laughs> Uh, if you look at current, which is the bottom this week, we're twice as much as uh, a year ago, 5.45% in D4, 17% in D3 and D4, that's, you know, extreme and oh my god, as opposed to 7.6%, about double for current too. So, um, I mean, a double for D2 through 4. So, and then, you know, then it gets close. But right now, if you look at this, in terms of dryness, that's about two-thirds, just shy of two-thirds of the country. Of course, it was worse last week. It was worse three months ago. It was worse on January 1st, yeah, where it was almost three-quarters. It was now just down to two-thirds. Started the water year even worse. So if you look at that, you could also say we're improving. But that shows you, um, let's go to the next one. If you, um, all right, AP, we write this all the time. But just 70, since we're here in Oklahoma, 76 of the 77 counties um, are, disaster areas. Let's go to the next one. Of course, the pictures. Well, we see, you've seen enough pictures. You don't need to see that. And I'm trying to hurry. So let's, all right. So just to try to bring things together, there are three worlds here that I want to explain to you at where they intersect. There's the worlds of scientists like Harold and Deke. There's the world of climate science, uh, like what Harold and Deke study. And then there's the world of journalism like me and Mike and a few others here. So you need to understand that these are worlds that don't normally come together <laughs> and really shouldn't. So let's look at them. So there's, here's the world of science, scientists. You know, let's look at five things about them. You, in the world of science, you're looking at data, not anecdotes. We, you know, scientists like hard numbers, They're objective things, not subject. If you think about it, it's sort of, um, if you remember Rob McEwen, it's a cool medium. It, you just take things back and uh, not hot. It's things are incremental. Scientists like changes in the tenth of a degree, in the two tenths of a degree. You read scientific papers, 
They go on for dozens and scores of pages. The National Climate Assessment, which just came out this about a month ago, I think it's 18, 16 to 18 megabytes if you download it. You know, that's just, just absurd. Um, and, you know, if you really want to do something quickly, you don't do it in science. You know, science, there's a new field in, a new field in climate scientists, which is a relatively new field. It's, it's, it's climate attribution, studying extreme events to see, can we say this is climate, science, climate change? And, you know, journalists like me, you know, if there's a drought going on, I want to know right now, is this global warming? How much of this can we say is climate change? You know, if you, uh, with a heat wave. Now they can do that. And they could tell you in about six or seven years sometimes. <laughs> so that's, you know, it really is helpful for Gerald. So you get a study that said, do you remember that heat wave in 2003 in France that killed 30 some thousand people? By the way, climate change. It's like, yeah, thanks. All right, so that's the, that, that's the world of scientists. Uh, let's go to the next one. Just to go a little further, if you look at it, you know, you've got your theoreticians on the left, the experimentalists on the right, in the center, and on the right, there's some good science communicators. Harold is one of them. Deke is another, actually, who are good with the media and know how to express things. All right, let's go next. Into that subcategory of blue is the world of, sub, a subcategory of, is climate science. Climate science. So here you have climate averages. For about 20, 30 years, when climate scientists talked, they talked about changes in mean temperature, average temperature for you and me. They talked about tenths of degrees, um, t maybe half inches of rain. You know, they, these are things that are happening gradually. These are very incremental. These are things you and I just don't feel. Did you notice that you know, this year was on average two tenths of a degree warmer than 10 years ago? Probably not. I know I didn't. All right, um, then you have, so that, that's really what climate change has been about until about five years ago when scientists started talking about extremes. And the only reason they started talking about extremes is because nature dragged them kicking and screaming. It's, the extremes started showing up and you got, had people like Jerry Meal at, the, um, at NCAR talking about this. You had uh, scientists like Camille Parmesan at the University of Texas who was noticing, in the changes in species, the changing in timing of things, of when flowers bloom. These were happening not just because of slow changes. They are connected to, to extreme events. So then you know, you got extreme events like water. That's another thing of too much and too little water. But the trouble is, as, as, as you heard earlier, water is one of these things that's, you know, it's, it's, it's so important, but it's, again, incremental. I mean, a drought, do you cover a drought today? Do you write about it today? Do you write about it tomorrow? It's not going to change much in a day unless you have a big rainstorm. So that, and then you've got those extremes. So let's go to the next one. Now you have my world, the world of journalists. It was too temp, you know, I avoided making it yellow because that would just be a cliche. <laughs> That's television is a cliche in print. We avoid them like the plague. Um, <laughs> so you've got the world of journalists. We like anecdotes, not data. We, you know, usually you, you talk to reporters, the first or two par paragraphs of a story are the most important. We call it the lead. You often hear something about people love anecdotal leads. Anecdotes, not data. Subjective. Listen to TV reporters. How do you feel about that? <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's a hot medium, not a cold medium. We like drama not incremental. We like it brief. I usually get 600 words, 800 words, if I'm lucky, 1,000 words to write about something. We like it fast. You know, don't tell me about something that happened 10 years ago. All right, let's go to the next one. So, at, at that, you have the science and tech media, science, tech, medical reporters who do a good job, who, who oh boy, I'm, I'm done. Um, <laughs> That was 10 minutes already? Wow. I'm the only one who follow, um, who's not following it, I guess. So you have the science and tech media explainers. We sort of understand scientists. So that yet we're up the top. Then you have general assignment reporters, political reporters who just love, you know, conflict. <laughs> Shouting. That's fun. Television morning shows where you, know, you don't have much news. Sports reporters and celebrity journals. So now let's bring them together. You know, I'm not very good at putting Venn diagrams together because you don't see the intersection. Let's go to the next one. You know, I'm not good at PowerPoint. But here's what's in that intersection. Climate extremes, heat waves, 
storms, science writers like me, good science communicators like Harold and, and Deke, and the letter B because I somehow left that in. <laughs> the next one. Here's what's not in it. Most television reporters, many politicians, some that you know too closely, the pol political he said, she said, you know, about that goes with climate science, and most importantly for this session, water issues. Water is just doesn't, it, it doesn't fit with the extremes because it ends up being incremental. The next one, so, um, and let's go to the next, and the next one, you know, droughts, next one after that. Water's taken for, we've heard that, we'll go after that. All right, and we've heard this, you don't need to hear this again. Some advice for journalists, actually the reason I'm here today is because of a drought in Florida, South Florida in 1990. I was a political reporter, a government reporter. Drought happened, I had to cover it, I turned to like it, it, became, it consumed me. That's all I did for a few years was drought reporting, and then weather reporting, then science reporting, and now I do science, very little drought. When I was down there, um, there are a couple stories for those reporters here that you should do that you don't think about. It's you've got to think these things through. One of my favorites is everyone, you know, most places you've got water bills, right? You know how much more, if you're using more or less water. And if it's a place like here where they have wa mandatory water restrictions, you, especially depending on Freedom of Information Act laws, and just a quick plug as a reporter, we need Freedom of Information Act laws in every state and country, and we need them to be enforced. Um, <laughs> One of the things we did when they put water restrictions in South Florida is we went and looked at the, wa the water manager's own personal bills. They were telling us to cut back on water. Their water usage went up. <laughs> Government agencies' water usage went up. These are things you can do as a reporter to check and should do. Another thing I did, as a, um, I did is we got a family to let us spend di several days, almost a whole week, watching them use their water. We monitored their water. They let me in, the father let me in the shower with him. He wore water, uh, s uh, swimming trunks, so don't worry. We watched how each bit of water, how they used it, and got people to say, here's where you could change. These are stories that could and should be done. Sometimes they're not being done. And, 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 and this is where we bring this home. I mean, the, the thing with water use is we use far more water than we need to. And it's not that hard. To, to, to cut it back. So I think um, since I'm way over, let's go to the end here. We just, um, yeah. Oh, one other thing. If you're doing a big water project, I spent months on this. You know, I went all over South Florida to document with a photographer main problems day before, two days before, three inches of rain. <laughs> we almost didn't run the story. Finally, we called it dry despite deluge. <laughs> you know, if you got the story, it's going to rain, so you better hurry it in. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. You'll see my uh, uh, ring. It. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Folks, the hour is getting a little late, but if there are those of you who want to stay a few minutes and ask a few questions, we can take a few questions before we quit for the evening. Um, and I leave the floor then open to you. Anyone like to ask? Or? Any of our panelists a question? They were so thorough, they drove all your answers away or answered all your <laughs> questions, or uh, perhaps it's been a long day. I have, I'll just start with one question for, for Terry, if you don't mind. Uh, Terry, you talked about this mega water, this deep water. Deep water. Um, uh, in the center in this of the United States, States, do these sort of aquifers exist? Yes. How deep would that be? How deep would that be? And how expensive would that be? They actually, they are do exist. Uh, they run in in various areas from North Dakota. I mean, they're not subject to political borders, obviously, so they're up in Canada as well. Um, North Dakota through South Texas and across the border into Mexico. Uh, Kansas actually being a, a prime place we're looking at right now. So they, and they they tend to run anywhere from six to eight hundred feet down to maybe twenty five hundred three thousand feet uh, feet down, and depending upon the degree of difficulty um, to put a rig in between the time you've you've uh, surveyed 
explored and put a rig in, you're not talking more than uh, two or three million bucks per, per piping. So it's, it's, not, it's not a titanic amount of money in that regard. We have a question in the back. There are, there. I mean, some of them are, some of them are rechargeable, and some of them actually have been depleted. So I don't know on that. Sorry, um, on that one, I can check for you because I know that that had been a, a site we had looked at um in terms of viability and we rejected it um but i can check with the scientists and get back to you if that would be useful we'll put it absolutely I, I find it a little uh, hard to believe it's been a lawsuit over a, a rain barrel yet, but uh, on the other hand, you, you can sue over anything, whether you'll be successful is another, another thing. You know, just one way to think of this is we tend to try to do these cheap and quick fixes that don't work here in Oklahoma City, um, and this is some of the work of the students back there. Uh, we, I was talking with them. This, you have uh, Lake Hefner was just renewed um, from another lake. You got, uh, that was, I think, um, what was it, 15 billion gallons of water in there? Is that what we think? No. Um, I'm sorry, it was, uh, it was essentially uh, five months of water for, if you look at everyone in Oklahoma City, and just personal use of water. All that water that came flowing in was enough for just five months for the, just the residents of the city. So, you know, I'll come back August, you know, look at that lake. So you look at these things and we tend to do these, it's cheaper, it's, it's quicker, but they don't seem to be the real. Yeah, like I said, I haven't had a chance to, uh, what was the conservation efforts uh, being promoted of, you know, keep a rain barrel, don't pull from the um, larger water supply, if at all possible, um, where that supply line, like I said, I've heard this word, but I haven't had a chance to research it. If you don't, you know, generally in these things, my feeling is if you don't hear a name attached, um, then, then, you know, I'd be a little more suspicious. But it, this sound, so, but it, this wasn't one rain barrel for personal use. This was to. Right. No, I know. I guess my point is the way you were talking about it. You think about it as just one person, you know, one rain barrel, barrel off their roof to, you know, to water their plants, as opposed to, you know, the amount of water to replenish a pond is a little bit more than that. But so I stand corrected, though. Please. Are any of the panelists aware of any research uh, into the fracking that's being done and the ejection of the waste and the migration of those who are sucked off the river via falls and other conflicts? Has anyone done any research on that at all? 
Are you talking about water quality, or I'm, I just I missed a word or two there? Or are you talking about earthquake um, seismic activity in fracking? Uh, Um, not in terms of the, the lower aquifers. All I could tell you is I know um, some, a colleague of mine who's been covering the fracking um, industry you know, a little bit, a lot more, and uh, I've been helping him out. Is we when we've looked nationwide, and there's been some new work from Noah Boulder on this. Is you you could see water issues in some places, water quality issues in some places, and not in others, which tends to point you in the area that it's a practices issue more than anything. You know, there's, there are some areas, um, I think in Texas, where there's not a problem, and then, there, you know, and then there are others, areas where it's a big problem. And a lot has to do with infrastructure and practices. Gary, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, actually, I'll just echo precisely what Seth just said. I mean, it, it is a practice issue, and I think there were people at the beginning of, of the fracking industry who just sort of, you know, fly-by-night guys. Um, but I think that if you approach it from a, the deep water, pristine water situation, then uh, you tend to avoid the the issues you just discussed. Um, I'm, I know for our from firsthand in Texas, uh, the rules and regulations and enforcement are pretty, pretty onerous. Um, and then as a corporation, of course, it's in your own best interest to operate uh, as, as cleanly as possible. I sure did. Uh, we'll let you go first. Sure. Um, I would just re-echo my opening point um, dealing specifically with drought is that um, the best time to work on the next drought is during the green time uh, before it. Um, I think getting actively involved in water planning and water management issues and realizing that um, both through human growth and through the growth in the demand from the atmosphere realized that um, the water that we know today, um, that we've discovered today, is uh, going to become more precious. And um, it's the one thing we share as a species. Um, so I think uh, being more active and, and understanding and planning for that next shortage, you know, um, it will come again. I would, I would agree. I think that the forward planning and not being afraid to take the long view, um, it's not a short-term fix. Take the long view It's gonna, it, uh, and take the best brains and apply it and think outside the box, think laterally. Um, make sure that, that all those things are, are at least listened to and even if they may fly in the face of convention, pay attention to them. Well, I, I think we really have a, a, the big challenge is that the, is the political or the political entities, and we and the fact that water starts in one place and ends up in another place. We you, when you look at the history of the of water in the West in the Colorado River Basin, um, you know there's a lot of fights between California and Colorado that come out of that. And uh, in this part of the country, we're we haven't seen those as bad yet, but that's happening. I mean that, that's coming when with a you know, what do you do with the water that comes down the Red River? And all the lakes on both sides between Texas and, and, and Oklahoma. Dallas-Fort Worth is a big, very thirsty place. Uh, and how that gets handled out, especially given that we had, you know, in the 90s were very wet. And so there's a memory of wet. And how we handle negotiating those water rights and dealing with them 
in an intelligent way is, I think, a really hard problem, and I certainly don't have a clue about how to do it. That's when I'm not a policy person. I pass. <laughs> That's about my pay grade. <laughs> You know, I, I don't think we can control what's coming out of the skies. I think we can control what we use and how we use it, and areas that are you uh, that regularly get droughts should be prepared. But that's not our societal way. Just go to Las Vegas and see all the green lawns. I mean, that's that is not smart water use. Um, my other one of my other beats is, is so said is astronomy. I was just covering a proposed human mission to Mars where they're going to take a limited amount of water and reuse it regularly. Um, that's in, in other words, they're going to be drinking their own pee and sweat. Uh, they do that in the space station sometimes now. We do it. We just don't think about it when we do it. That <laughs> there will be a time we'll have to do it. We'll have to, green lawns are, are really not a necessity. And the, clo the more expensive water gets, the more choices, these choices will be made. I mean, water will become an expense, and then you will see changes. But until then, you know, I don't know about you. If you have kids, water's free to them. You know, 10, 20 minute, 30 minute shower, why not? You know, they're not paying for it, and that's how we treat it as a society, like a 30 minute shower by a teenager. I'd comment, I would comment, uh, as a, I, was a, I was a naval officer and I was in the Navy, and I promise you, when we were on a ship, we realized how precious water was. When we took a shower in the Navy, it was a very quick shower. It was a, you get wet, you lather up, you turn the water back on, you wash off. And, and water, uh, first, first day out on a six-month cruise, our, our fresh water system was, was torn out by a, a hurricane. And I promise you, when we went from uh, Norfolk, Virginia to uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, every drop of water mattered. So uh, at that time, uh, I, I realized uh, that you do have to be prudent with how you what, look at water, and depending on your scenario. And I think you're exactly right. We've become a little spoiled in the way we, we, we uh, use our water today. We don't look at it as a precious resource that it is. Dan, was, was Seth in your shower too? <laughs> well, he had his bathing suit on. <laughs> yeah, we've got time for one, one more question. I see there's a hand in the back, please. Uh, Terry, when, when the, one of our students, and a very good student, as all of our students are, <laughs> Absolutely. was asking a specific case of what happens when the water dries up in southwest Oklahoma. But in a broader sense, what happens when the water dries up in the region? Are we going to war? Or is there going to be civil unrest? In the national intelligence estimate, what do you say about that? Um, I think civil unrest is probably an extreme case, and I think that within within the U.S. and our own jurisprudential system, I think there are enough mechanical ways to to arbitrate it out and allocate water. Um, and so I think the, the the points have been made that um, you know it's slow. That's the problem. There's there's nobody who's willing to take a political risk, um, and that that's really the the touchstone. So. I wouldn't say that you're going to have civil unrest. Um, I would say that you're going to have financial dislocation because in order to either buy or borrow or recycle and recirculate water is going to cost a titanic amount of money and somebody's going to have to pay for it. So that I think is going to be the biggest issue. Uh, labor can be mobilized, technology can be mobilized, but it's the money. Um, that I think is going to be the, the real issue. Um, but you can take a case in point where Cyprus uh, ran out of water, has been running out of water every summer for the last couple of years, and they tank water in. Um, in Oklahoma, you don't have that luxury, I don't think. But um, in, other, in other jurisdictions and other places, they do, they do go to extreme measures. Yeah, 